Pal Mal Famous Cigarettes present The Big Story. You're sure everything is all right, Tony? Sure and sure. We phoned that reporter and told him there was a story waiting for him here, so he... Hey. What is it? There he is now. That's the reporter. Wait until he comes closer. Wait until he turns into the walk. You don't want to miss him, do you, Tiny? Miss him? <laughs> when I get through unloading this rod, that reporter's going to look like a Swiss cheese. <laughs> The Big Story. Here is America. Its sound and its fury, its joy and its sorrow, as faithfully reported by the men and women of the great American newspapers. Atlanta, Georgia. From the pages of the Atlanta Constitution, the authentic story of a reporter who set out to clean up a lottery by gambling with his life. Tonight, to Keeler McCartney of the Atlanta Constitution goes the Pell-Mell Award for the big story. Of all America's leading cigarettes, only one is outstanding. Only one is outstanding. It's the longer, finer cigarette. Pell-Mell. Look at a Pell-Mell. It looks good. Feel a Pell-Mell. It feels good. Taste a Pell-Mell. It tastes good. Smoke a Pell-Mell. It smokes good. Now you've discovered why so many of your friends have changed to Pell-Mell, the longer, finer cigarette. For Pell-Mell's greater length of traditionally fine, mellow tobaccos filters the smoke on the way to your throat. That's important. Yes, Pell-Mell's greater length filters the smoke on the way to your throat, gives you that smoothness mildness, and satisfaction no other cigarette offers you. Of all America's leading cigarettes, only one is outstanding. Only one is outstanding. The longer, finer cigarette in the distinguished red package. Pell-Mell famous cigarettes. Outstanding. And they are mild. And now, the story as it actually happened. Keeler McCartney's story as he lived it. Atlanta, Georgia. You are Keeler McCartney, police reporter for the Atlanta Constitution. You're young, conscientious, and hot. You stand in your city editor's office, listening to his dry voice briefing you on new assignment. And you wish you could dive head first into a glass of beer. When the voice stops, you melt out of the office to your own desk, your half-hearted notes clinging damply to your fingers. Hiya, Mac. Hot enough for you? Pete, if one more guy asks if it's hot enough for me, I'm going to pop him one. Yeah, it's hot enough for me. It's hot enough for a tamale. Hey, what's the matter with you, editor? Toss your lousy assignment? Uh... Mac, he says, get this. Mac, I want you to see what you can do about cleaning up the lottery racket in town. Eighteen million dollars a year those racketeers are making. Enough to buy plenty of Tommy guns to bump off any reporter who's dope enough to stick his nose into that setup. How do they operate the thing? Uh, you lay a bet on the third, fourth, and fifth digits of the daily bond total in the paper. Uh-huh. Pays off 450 to one, but the odds are 1,000 to one against you. How do you find out about a lottery, anyhow? Place a bet. Fellow down the street from me, Joe Sampson, he gambles a lot on it. Ask him. He should be able to make contact for you. Okay, what can I lose? Nothing but a buck. Or, who knows, you might even make a killing. <laughs> Hey, is anybody home? Oh, I'm outside in the garden. Oh, didn't see you. You're Mrs. Sampson? That's right. 
You picked a pretty rugged day for weeding, didn't you? I sure did. Hot enough for you? Yeah, it is. Um, uh, I'm looking for Mr. Sampson. Is he in? Why, no. Uh... I wanted to ask him about placing a lottery bet. Get out of here. Well, now, wait a minute. You don't understand. I understand I... enough. You're a writer, aren't you? Well, sure, I'm a reporter, but... A reporter? Yeah. Oh, I- I'm sorry. I I thought you were one of those lottery writers that comes to see Joe all the time. What have you got against them? I wish they were all dead. Wait a minute. The lottery's against the law, sure, but what, what harm can it do? You really want to know that? Well, sure. Come on up on the porch where it's cooler. I owe you a glass of buttermilk for biting your head off anyhow. And after that, I'd like to tell you a story. All right? All right. It's a deal. Maybe it's not much of a story, Mr. McCartney. It's the kind of thing that probably happens to a lot of people. The thing is, this time it happened to Joe and me. We were married about a year then when... Mrs. Sampson, I gotta hand it to you. I married the best-looking gal in the state and the best cook in the world. Oh, Joe. Mm-hmm. Now that am good apple pie. <laughs> Sour as a banker's disposition. Oh, say, that reminds me. I put some money in our bank today. Our bank? Mm-hmm. The blue teapot on the kitchen counter. I call that our bank. Oh, the first national Sampson, huh? <laughs> I put in another three dollars, Joe. You're saving so you can be independently wealthy? Joe, you haven't forgotten. Forgotten what? The house out on Fifth Street. The, the white one with the blue shutters and the peach tree in the yard. Oh, what about it? Oh, it's going to be ours someday. That's what about it. Just as soon as we can fill that teapot with enough three dollars to buy it. <laughs> you sure think in slow motion, Jeannie. I'll figure out a way to make a pile of dough fast, and we'll move into that house next year. Oh, no, Joe, no. If we just save a little bit each week, we'll have it soon enough. Oh, it's better that way, Joe. Honest. Okay, honey, have it your way. You go ahead and save the pennies in the teapot, but I'm going to see if I can throw in the dollars. Hey, how about another piece of that apple pie? Joe's always like that, Mr. McCartney. Fast. He can't wait for things. Well, like like planting those flowers in the yard. Uh, Joe was swell about digging up the dirt for me, but he doesn't like the waiting for the flowers to come up. Anyhow, Joe brought me the three dollars I asked for from his check every payday, and I'd go put it in the blue teapot. Got so as I'd wait for him on the porch steps every Friday. Hi, baby. Give it to me. Give what to you? The three dollars for the teapot. Uh... Look, honey, I haven't got it. You, you haven't got it? Oh, but, but Joe... Listen, Jeannie, did you ever hear of the bug, the lottery? You know, you bet on the numbers and the bond total each day, and if you win, they pay you 450 to 1. Well, all we need is to hit it right just once, and we've got a down payment on the house. Oh, Joe, no, no. Please don't gamble. Just give me the money and let me put it away in the teapot. Oh, come on, baby, be a sport. Just a few bucks, that's all. Well, what harm can it do? <laughs> Jeannie, what are you doing in here? What are you doing, Joe? What do you want with that teapot? Look, honey, I got a specially lucky feeling today, see? I just want to borrow a couple of bucks from the teapot for the bug. I'll put it back tomorrow. Look, Jeannie, how about sparing me a few bucks, huh? The teapot's empty, Joe. Yeah, yeah, I mean, from the housekeeping money. Oh, Joe. I got a hunch today on number 419. I figure all I have to do is lay ten bucks on that and I can clean up and get back all my losings in one hit. Joe, you've got to bring your check home next week. I can't pay the bills. You've got to stop gambling. How can I stop? I got to make up my losses, don't I? But, 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 there ain't no buts, I tell you. I got to make dough fast and there ain't no faster way than the bug. Oh, look, Jeannie, don't be mad at me. I I got a feeling, honey, I'm going to be lucky tomorrow. I heard of people that couldn't stop drinking, Mr. McCartney. Men who kept on drinking even when it made them sick. Well, that's how gambling is with Joe now. Something rotten, something he can't get away from, even though it's like poison and he's sick with it. 
Last night I sat across the table in the kitchen just looking at him. Watching him kind of sit there and fall away into little pieces. Just looking at him. What the devil are you looking at? You. Well, quit it. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. Do you always have to be sorry? I'm sorry. Why don't you give it up, Joe? What are you talking about? The lottery. Give it up, Joe. Why don't you give up picking on me? I'm not picking on you. Yes, you are. I don't bet because I want to. I bet because I'd be a dope to stop now. I've lost too much to quit now when my number's going to come up. You know it won't. It's got to come up someday, doesn't it? And when it does, we'll be rich. Rich? What do we want to be rich for? We just want to save enough to put in our bank Yeah, and... sure. Lousy nickels and pennies to put in the bank so we can buy a house when we're 80. That's not true. You know it isn't. We had lots of money in the bank before... Before what? Well, go ahead, say it. Before I robbed the bank to gamble, that's what you were going to say, right? No, Joe. Before Joe robbed the bank, before Joe swiped the money. I'm not blaming you. You just think I robbed your lousy bank, that's all. No, I did All right, all right, I did. I robbed a lousy little broken-down teapot. I swiped the money and I left it empty. Lousy little teapot with a lousy little broken handle. It's all empty. Look at it. All empty. And I don't care. You hear me, Jeannie? I don't care. I don't care a hoot about your lousy little teapot. <laughs> The love of heaven, help me. Joe. Joey. I can't stop, Jean. It's like being drunk or crazy. Every week when I get my check, I say, This time I'll bring it home to Jeannie. This time I'll give it all to Jeannie. And that guy comes along with his lottery, and I, I can't stop. What are we going to do, honey? I don't know. Oh, Joe, I wish they were all dead. So do I. You, Keela McCartney, feel a slow, burning anger that starts deep in your guts and rips its way up to the lump in your throat. You're suddenly ashamed because you can still hear yourself saying carelessly, The lottery? What harm can it do? And now you know. Can't anybody do anything to stop it, Mr. McCartney? I don't know. I sure don't know what one guy with a typewriter can do against thousands of guys with lottery sheets and tommy guns, but... Well, I'm going to try. We'll be back in just a moment with tonight's big story. Of all America's leading cigarettes, only one is outstanding. Only one is outstanding. It's the longer, finer cigarette. Pell-Mell. Look at a Pell-Mell. It looks good. Feel a Pell-Mell. It feels good. Taste a Pell-Mell. It tastes good. Smoke a Pell-Mell. It smokes good. Now you've discovered why so many of your friends have changed to Pell-Mell. The longer, finer cigarette. Pell-Mell. Good to look at, good to feel, good to taste, and good to smoke. For Pell-Mell's greater length of traditionally fine, mellow tobaccos filters the smoke on the way to your throat. That's important. Yes, Pell-Mell's greater length filters the smoke on the way to your throat. Gives you that smoothness, mildness, and satisfaction no other cigarette offers you. Of all America's leading cigarettes, only one is outstanding. Only one is outstanding. The longer, finer cigarette in the distinguished red package. Pell-Mell famous cigarettes. Outstanding. And they are mild. This is Cy Harris, returning you to your narrator and the big story of Keeler McCartney as he lived it and wrote it. You, Keela McCartney, are mad, hot and mad. Hot because the late summer Georgia sun has made a furnace of Atlanta's streets. Mad because a lottery called the Bug is wrecking the lives of Atlanta's people. The Bug. You've written stories about it, and you know it's an ugly, crawling thing that takes the dimes and the dollars of Atlanta's poor. So, you take your temper and your thirst into a bar where you know the workers for the bug congregate. 
You walk out of the burning sun into the dimness and the coolness, and you say... One beer. And then you wait. You wait while the eyes along the bar study you. And the eyes from the table study you. You wait, and you drink your beer, and you feel the eyes upon you. And then... Hi. Hello. Hot enough for you? You bet. You know, I ain't seen you before. I'm new. None of the boys, they ain't seen you before. Well, I'm new. Writer? Mm-hmm. Mark McClellan? Uh-huh. South side? That's right. Claude don't operate on the south side. He does now. What do you mean? He started this morning. You mean he's going to muscle in on Daniels? Figure it out yourself. Well, that's good news. Glad to hear it. They call me Tiny. Have a beer? Sure. I'm Red. Oh, pleased to meet you, Red. Two beers, Freddy. The reason I cased you first off, uh, we got to be careful. Sure. The newspapers are getting after us. Sure. This guy McCartney on the Constitution. There is one prize louse. Sure. Yeah. He's going to wake up some morning and find himself dead. Have another beer, Tiny? Sure, pal, sure. How'd you make out this week? Collected $2,784. <laughs> you know something, pal. People are awful suckers. Congratulations, Mac. Those stories of yours on the bug are beginning to pay off. The cops picked up three lottery bosses again yesterday. They're only the little guys, Pete. We have to get the big ones. The biggest one. Well, go to it. Sure. Trouble is, I don't know who he is. Look, pal, suppose I do get picked up. One of it. This lawyer the boss hired can get a charge buried for years. Great guy, the boss. I, um, uh, I never met him. Great guy. Never comes around here, does he? The boss? In a crumb joint like this? <laughs> Don't be funny. Dan Hurlbut is a gentleman. The word is to take it slow, pal. What's up? Oh, this lousy reporter, this McCartney on the Constitution. He's found out Dan Hurlbut's the boss. Dan says we got... Watch it, pal. What? A cop just come into the bar heading this way. Hey, Mac! Hey, Mac! Hey, listen, I just happened to catch sight of you through the window. Break for me. Look, drop off this accident report for me at the station, will you, Mac? Got to hurry. Wife's birthday, you know how it is. And I'm late, too. Thanks a lot, Mac. Mac. Now, ain't that a coincidence? This Keela McCartney over at the Constitution. I hear they call him Mac, too. That's it. He knows. They all know. A sudden, ugly silence falls over the bar. And all those eyes turn toward you again. All those ugly, pig-like eyes. You stand up. You put a hand into your hip pocket. You back towards the door. Slowly, slowly, keeping a steady watch on Tiny and his pals. And then you push open the bar door. And you're outside in the street. And you start to run. You take your hand out of your hip pocket because you didn't have a gun anyway. You just run. So 
Just how much do you think this McCartney person knows about us, Tanny? Well, you know how it is, Mr. Herbert. Some of the boys ain't careful like me. Some of the boys get a little liquored up and they talk too much. In other words, Tanny, it might be advisable to liquidate this reporter? <laughs> like you say, Mr. Herbert, liquidate. Mm. If we could figure out some way to entice him to the Yellow House. Do you think we could entice McCartney to the Yellow House, Tanny? Sure, I'll have Blanche call him with a phony story. Just tell me when you want him, Mr. Herbert. Just tell me when. Hello, Samson. Leave me alone, will you, Tiny? How much you want to place on the buck tonight, Joe? Well, cut it out, Tiny. Please cut it out. I'm taking my check home tonight, you hear me? Sure, sure. But how about that little house you and the wife was planning? I thought you guys were going to be stopped. That guy on the paper, that Keela McCartney. He'll get you guys, the whole bunch of you. Yeah, I'll tell you a secret, Joe. McCartney's through. The boys at the yellow house are going to take care of him. Now, uh, what'd you say, 15 bucks, Joe? All right, all right, 15 bucks on number 419, and I hope I never see you again as long as I live. Joe Sampson, $15 on number 419. You sure everything is all right, Tony? Sure, I'm sure, Mr. Herbert. Blanche telephoned McCartney, told him there was some kind of a story here, I... Hey. What is it? Just turn in the corner there. That's McCartney. Wait until he turns into the walk. You don't want to miss. Miss? <laughs> when I get through unloading this rod, that reporter's going to look like a Swiss cheese. I sincerely hope so. Now, wait, Tiny. Wait until he turns into the walk. Just another few steps, Tiny. Just a couple more steps. Jean, what are you doing here? I, I just called your office and they told me where you're going. And Joe just, just told me what the writer said to him. What writer? The one called Tiny. Tiny? Yeah. What did he say? He said, the boys in the yellow house will take care of you. In the yellow house? Yeah, do you know what he meant? The yellow house? Nope, rings no bells. Oh. Well, thanks anyway, Jean. I'll go in here now and cover this story. And maybe I'll check on the yellow house business later. All right. Oh, but take care of yourself. Don't worry, I'll be... Jean. Yeah? Do you see the number on this house right here? Oh, uh, it says, uh, 224, Miss Dupe. I just got an anonymous phone call to cover a story at number 224. But what's that got... <gasps> you see what I mean? Number 224 is a yellow house. <laughs> Can you tie that? He beat it. Well, Tiny, that's the second time you failed me. Me, Mr. Hubbard? You, Tiny. I found out it was you who talked too much and started all this difficulty. And now you've bungled an opportunity to rectify your mistake. Tiny, much as I regret the necessity, you are through. You, Keela McCartney know who's behind this plot to erase you? Dan Hurlbut. And you know that he'll get you, too. Unless you get him first. But how? That's the question. How? How can you pin a guy down if nobody will squeal on him, Pete? What's with this Dan Hurlbut character? He made a solid goal? Just about. He treats his writers well, gives them big percentages of their take, protects them when they get in trouble. Uh-oh, more trouble. If it's another anonymous tip, hang up, Mac. It's too hot to go to a funeral. McCartney speaking. This the McCartney that's been writing them stories on the lottery? Yeah, who's this? Nobody. Look, I used to be in the lottery business myself, see? What business you in now? Giving tips to reporters. No, thanks. You'll want to hear this, McCartney. A guy by the name of Dan Herbert has 70 cases of whiskey stored in a garage over on Melrose Avenue, see? And he ain't got no permit for him, see? Yeah, I see. Guys with no permits for storing whiskey can get arrested. I suppose you take it from there, Mac. Hey, wait a minute. Now I get your voice. Tiny. T Hello. Hello, Tiny. Hello, Tip. Nope. Hung up. Another tip? From Tiny, the writer I got mixed up with. Just recognize the voice. He must have had a falling out with Herbert. He just squealed on him. Something hot? Herbert's got 70 cases of whiskey in a garage on Melrose. To coin a phrase, 
Is that hot enough for you? It's hot enough for anyone, including the police. Dan Hurlbut is arrested for storing whiskey without a permit. Then the police begin their relentless questioning and finally secure the three-page confession which wipes up what's left of the lottery racket in Atlanta. And then one afternoon, you take a stroll out to see your old friends, the Sampsons. Hi, Jeannie. Still at the weeding? Yeah, place is a mess. Want some buttermilk? I could be persuaded. Joe home? Oh, not yet. He stopped by to get his paycheck. I, uh... Bought a new teapot today. And well, it... here's its chief depositor now. Oh. Hi, Joe. Hi, Mac. Good to see you. Hello, baby. How about a kiss, huh? Give it to me. What? For three dollars for the bank. You settle for two? Joe Sampson, you... Now, you... take it easy, honey. I, I saw these flowers downtown, and I thought they'd, well, kind of brighten up the place while those ones you planted take their own sweet time blooming. Oh, Joe, you big lug. And then, well, I had to stop and get Mac here a couple of cigars to say thanks, <laughs> didn't I? <laughs> In just a moment, we'll read you a telegram from Keeler McCartney of the Atlanta Constitution with the final outcome of tonight's big story. Of all America's leading cigarettes, only one is outstanding. Only one is outstanding. The longer, finer cigarette in the distinguished red package. Pell-Mell, good to look at, good to feel, good to taste, and good to smoke. For Pell-Mell's greater length of traditionally fine, mellow tobaccos filters the smoke on the way to your throat. That's important. Yes, Pell-Mell's greater length filters the smoke on the way to your throat. Gives you that smoothness, mildness, and satisfaction no other cigarette offers you. Remember, Pell-Mell famous cigarette. Outstanding. And they are mild. Now we read you that telegram from Keeler McCartney of the Atlanta Constitution. Previously unable to get any evidence against lottery boss in tonight's big story, arresting him on a liquor charge was the only way to legally hold him. Once in custody, he was persuaded to confess that he employed 1,200 people in Atlanta's $7 million lottery ring. A 15-count indictment was secured against him, and he was sentenced to six years on the chain gang at Tattnall State Prison in Reedsville. My sincere appreciation for tonight's Pell-Mell Award. Thank you, Mr. McCartney. The makers of Pell-Mell famous cigarettes are proud to have named you the winner of the Pell-Mell $500 Award for notable service in the field of journalism. Listen again next week, same time, same station, when Pell-Mell famous cigarettes will present another big story. A big story from the front pages of the Los Angeles Herald Express. Byline, Pat Foley. A big story about a meek little man with a mania for marriage and murder. The Big Story is produced by Bernard J. Proctor with music by Vladimir Zelensky. Tonight's program was written by Gail Ingram. Your narrator was Bob Sloan, and George Petrie played the part of Keeler McCartney. In order to protect the names of people actually involved in tonight's authentic big story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed, with the exception of the reporter, Mr. McCartney. This is Ernest Chappell speaking for the makers of Pell Mall Famous Cigarettes. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.